Hey Lifesavers, welcome back to another NCLEX preparation video. My name is Nurse Kelly Tyrell, and in today's video, we are going to cover maternal complications and treatments. Most pregnancies will occur without any complications. However, some women who are pregnant will experience complications that involve their health, their baby's health, or both. Sometimes diseases or conditions the mother had before she came into pregnancy can lead to complications during pregnancy, and some complications can occur during the delivery delivery of the baby. So even with complications, early detection and prenatal care is the best way an expecting mother can reduce her risk and have the best possible outcome for her and her baby. The normal symptoms of pregnancy and the symptoms of complications are sometimes really hard to distinguish, but if they're detected early, most pregnancy complications are manageable with prompt treatment. So now let's review the most common complications you'll find on the NCLEX that women experience during her pregnancy. The first one is high blood pressure. So high blood pressure occurs when the arteries that carry blood away from the heart to the organs and the placenta are narrowed. High blood pressure is associated with a higher risk of many other complications like preeclampsia. It also puts the expecting mother at a higher risk of having a baby well before her due date and having a small baby at the time of birth. So the major nursing goals of caring for women with high blood pressure is a uh, maintenance of the utero placental perfusion, prevention of seizures, prevention of complications such as HELP syndrome, DIC, and abruption. And we'll go over some of those complications in just a few minutes. One of the common high-risk medications used to help treat high blood pressure is magnesium sulfate, along with a beta blocker called labetalol. So because magnesium sulfate is such a highly used medication for high, treating high blood pressure in pregnancy, you'll wanna be familiar with side effects and be able to recognize the symptoms of magnesium toxicity, which include diminished or absent deep tendon reflexes, having a urinary output of less than 30 mLs per hour, a respiratory rate of less than 12 breaths per minute, and a diminished level of consciousness. It's also very important to remember that the antidote for magnesium sulfate is... If you guess calcium gluconate, you are correct. And calcium gluconate is administered to the mother at one to three grams via IV. Now let's talk about preeclampsia and eclampsia, which is also known as toxemia. So this occurs after the first 20 weeks of a pregnancy. And it's important to be able to spot the early symptoms of preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is differentiated between mild and severe. Mild preeclampsia is diagnosed when a pregnant woman has a systolic blood pressure of 140 or higher or a diastolic blood pressure of 90 or higher and either a urine with 0.3 or more grams of protein in a 24-hour specimen or a protein to creatinine ratio greater than 0.3 or blood tests that show kidney or liver dysfunction. They will also have fluid in the lungs and difficulty breathing, also a headache and visual impairments as well. Severe preeclampsia occurs when a pregnant woman has any of these following symptoms. So a systolic blood pressure of 160 or higher, or a diastolic blood pressure of 110 or higher on two occasions, at least four hours apart while the patient is on bed rest. They will also have a urine with five or more grams of protein in a 24 hour specimen or three or more grams of protein on two random urine samples collected at least four hours apart. Test results suggesting kidney or liver damage, for example, uh, blood tests that reveal low numbers of platelets or high uh, numbers of liver enzymes. Severe unexplained right upper quadrant stomach pain that does not respond to medication is also another symptom. And symptoms that include headache, visual disturbances, difficulty breathing, or having fluid build up in her body. Eclampsia occurs when women with preeclampsia develop seizures. So the seizures can happen before or during labor or even after the baby is delivered. Magnesium sulfate is again used for seizure prophylaxis and uh, it helps to control seizures in women who have been diagnosed with preeclampsia or eclampsia, along with delivering the baby as soon as possible. That's your number one treatment. Typical administration of magnesium sulfate in this case includes a loading dose of four to six grams IV infused over a period of 15 to 20 minutes, followed by a maintenance dose of one to three grams IV given per hour. Nursing management includes a 
assessment for magnesium toxicity by identifying the symptoms we had just talked about a few minutes ago. A severe and life-threatening complication of severe preeclampsia or eclampsia is known as HELP syndrome, and it typically occurs in the third trimester of pregnancy. The defining characteristics are hemolysis, which is a breakdown of red blood cells, so you'll start to see blood spilling into the urine, and the total red blood cell count on a CBC will actually be very low. Um, you'll also see elevated liver enzymes and a low platelet count, so this patient is is at an extremely high risk of hemorrhaging since their blood won't be able to clot adequately. And you can remember HELP as a mnemonic that stands for hemolysis, EL for elevated liver function tests, LP for low platelet count. Abdominal pain localized in the right upper quadrant is the most common symptom for HELP syndrome, so you wanna remember that. And the primary treatment is to deliver the baby as soon as possible. And when immediate delivery is not possible, medications can be used to try and control severe symptoms, which include corticosteroids, which will help to speed up the development of the baby's lungs. Um, you'll also wanna give antihypertensive medications to help lower the blood pressure. Also anticonvulsants to prevent seizures and a blood transfusion to help correct the anemia and the low platelet count. And it will also be important that the baby be continuously monitored during the uh, nursing interventions for HELP syndrome. Next, let's talk about gestational trophoblastic disease or also known as a molar pregnancy or GTD for short. So GTD is the degeneration and abnormal proliferation of the trophoblastic villi. So the cells become filled with clear fluid, giving them an appearance of grape-like vesicles. So what are the signs and symptoms of GTD? Well, the uterus expands faster than normal because the trophoblastic cells proliferate abnormally normally at such a rapid pace that the uterus will start to reach its growth landmarks before the usual time. You may also see a very high serum or urine test for HCG because the trophoblast cells actually produce the HCG and they are produced in large amounts because the trophoblast cells are growing rapidly so naturally you're going to have really high levels of HCG. And lastly, the patient may experience some vaginal bleeding because there's going to be a lot of um, stress and tension on that cervix causing that vaginal bleeding. Diagnostic tests are ordered to check for a presence that might indicate a positive GTD, such as a urine test or serum for HCG, because remember, a very high result for HCG might indicate the presence of an HMOL. An ultrasound is also used, which will actually show that dense growth of grape-like vesicles with a snowflake pattern filled with clear fluid instead of an actual normally looking developing embryo. So as far as medical management, the physician would order medications and other interventions that would ensure the safety of the woman during this complicated period. Physicians may order a prophylactic course of methotrexate, which attacks rapidly growing cells like the abnormally growing trophoblastic cells, or they may order a medication called dactinomycin, um, once the metastasis or spread of those cells occur. Upon identification of trophoblastic disease, the physician might also schedule a surgical intervention to remove it from the uterus of the woman through a procedure called a suction curatage. So this is the ideal management of gestational trophoblastic disease uh, to evacuate the mole inside the woman's uterus and avoid any further complications. Because if it stays longer inside of the reproductive system, it can have complications later down the line and could cause um, issues such as infertility. So nurses must also take action during these critical stages of the pregnancy. So we must be able to function on our own while we're waiting for any orders from the physician. So as far as nursing assessments go, you'll need to assess the abdominal girth of the pregnant woman to check to see if it's within the usual landmarks of pregnancy. You also want to assess for signs and symptoms of pregnancy-induced hypertension, or PIH for short, because a woman with an HMOL pregnancy, PIH can occur occur earlier than the 20th week of gestation. And lastly, you'll want to instruct the woman to save all perineal pads containing any clots or tissues that have been passed out during the bleeding because the doctor may want to send it to the lab for a biopsy. And the last two common complications we're going to review are placental abruption or abruptio placentae and placenta previa. 
So you'll need to make sure you're familiar with the differences between these two conditions. And an easy way to remember the biggest difference is previa means that there is an attachment issue and abruption means that there is a detachment issue. So let's start with placenta previa. So normally the placenta will attach at the top or sides of the uterus, but in some women, for whatever reason, the placenta will actually attach in the lower parts of the uterus, which can cover that cervical opening. There are three different types of placenta previa. So the first type is called total previa, which means that the placenta is completely covering that cervical opening. Then you have a partial previa where the placenta only partially covers the cervical opening and marginal previa where the placenta is near the edge of the cervical opening, but it's not actually covering that opening in any way. So now let's discuss the major signs and symptoms of placenta previa. So you can use the mnemonic previa to help you remember these signs and symptoms. So P is for painless vaginal bleeding that will be anywhere from mild to profuse and the bleeding will be bright red in nature. You wanna remember that. R is for a relaxed soft uterus that is non-tender upon palpation. E is for episodes of bleeding that will occur most likely uh, during the third trimester as the body prepares for the baby, the cervix starts to thin and it causes bleeding from where it's tearing the vessels in the placenta. And V is for visible bleeding, which is not to be confused with concealed bleeding that you'll find in some cases with abruptio placenta, and we'll uh, review that in just a few minutes here. I is for intercourse post bleeding, which means that the woman will experience some bleeding after intercourse because that placenta is sitting so close to the cervix, so any amount of um, tension or force is gonna rupture those tiny blood vessels and cause some bleeding. And A is for abnormal fetal position, which is usually a breach or bottom first or transverse lie, which means the baby is actually lying sideways. The baby's head should normally be in a downward position, but since the placenta is occupying that lower portion of the uterus, the baby actually can't be positioned head down. So now on a positive note, the fetal heart rate is typically normal because unlike with placental abruption, the placenta is still intact. So that means that it's able to deliver those nutrients from mom to baby. And as far as nursing interventions, the mom will need to be on complete pelvic rest, which means no vaginal exams or intercourse throughout the duration of her pregnancy. So this is just to try and avoid damage to the placenta since again, it's so low lying in the uterus. And these patients are also at high risk for bleeding, so you just wanna make sure that the mom has a type and cross um, in case she would need an emergent blood transfusion. And you should also anticipate needing normal saline solution with Y tubing and establishing an 18 gauge IV site. Contractions can also cause bleeding, so you may need to administer a tocolytic med uh, medication, which is used to help stop those contractions. Most women with total and partial previa will need to have a C-section just to avoid any complications of bleeding. And lastly, let's talk a little bit about abruptio placentae or placental abruption. So you have these two different types of placental abruption. You have total detachment and you have partial detachment. So you can use the mnemonic detached as a way to help you remember the signs and symptoms of placental abruption. So D is for dark red bleeding. So unlike remember with previa, you'll see the bright red bleeding, but with uh, abruption of the placenta, you'll see that dark red bleeding. And E is for extended fundal height from concealed bleeding. T is for tender uterus. A is for abdominal pain or contractions. C is for concealed bleeding that can stay inside the uterus and can actually backflow into the fallopian tubes. So the patient can actually enter shock without physically seeing any signs of blood loss at all because that blood is backflowing um, up into the fallopian tubes. H is for a hard abdominal 
abdomen, again, because that blood is backflowing and coagulating in her abdomen. And E is for experiences DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. So this is a major consequence of placental abruption and it causes clotting in the body followed by a depletion of all of those clotting factors and it leads to uncontrolled bleeding and possibly death. So it's a major complication. And lastly, D is for a distressed baby. So remember the placenta is damaged because it's detaching from the uterus wall, which is the baby's main nutrient supply. So if the baby isn't getting enough uh, nutrients, then they'll start to have a uh, heart rate abnormality. So that is unlike what we just talked about in placenta previa. So you can see that previa and abruption are polar opposites in their signs and symptoms, but both of these conditions put the mom at major risk for hemorrhage and bleeding. So these two conditions are really high on your priority list when you're caring for these types of patients as a nurse. And nursing care and management will include monitoring for signs of DIC. So you wanna watch for low platelet count, fibrinogen, and uh, prothrombin levels. You also wanna look for any gum bleeding in the mother, oozing at the injection or IV sites, petechiae or ecchymosis, microemboli, which are small clots that have formed in important blood vessels that supply uh, to those vital organs, and it can cause a decrease in urinary output also chest pain, difficulty breathing, and mental status changes. Other interventions include assessing for bleeding, obtaining a type and cross match in case mom needs a blood transfusion, checking vital signs every 15 minutes, and monitoring and marking the fundal height and abdominal girth. You'll also want to make sure that there is no abdominal manipulation or vaginal exams until the placenta abruption is ruled out with an ultrasound. And you want to place mom on her left side and not supine. So laying on your left side will actually increase the blood flow to the baby. And you will also want to monitor the baby continuously um, with the external fetal monitoring. And that concludes the end of this lesson. I hope that you found this information extremely valuable and it made you just a little more confident as you prepare to take your NCLEX. I just wanna thank you so much again, Lifesavers, for tuning in today. My name is Nurse Kelly Tyrell and I help nurses feel more confident, increase their test scores, and retain what they don't remember in nursing school. If this video helped you in any way, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to smash that subscribe button and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on any of my upcoming content and future videos. And why don't you go ahead and do me a favor and drop me a comment below. Just let me know where you're at with your nursing journey. I'd love to say hi and just connect with you. Also make sure you click that share icon to spread the word and encourage a fellow aspiring nurse. And last but not least, when you are ready to take your NCLEX, be sure to check out my NCLEX and Chill review where I help eliminate test anxiety and review detailed test taking strategies so you can have that unfair advantage to pass your exam on your very next attempt. Not ready to end the study sesh yet? Well, you are in luck because if you stick around, you can watch more of my videos coming at you in three, two, one. Bye, lifesavers.